is power. Today's world is geared to it. Without it, we should come to a grinding halt. Twice in two world wars, Britain has come perilously near to that halt. Commodore McMichael is one of the men who helped keep things going in those anxious days when Britain's very existence depended on nursing tankers across troubled Atlantic waters. He also remembers that vital pipeline which had to be floated across the channel to fuel a liberating army. Today, more and more oil flows faster and faster. Heat, transport, mechanization, nuclear power, all lean heavily on this precious, pungent, polluting, unattractive liquid. Chemicals extracted from it provide detergents. They're also used in making nylons, a whole range of plastics and even lipsticks. How much oil does Britain use? If on Trafalgar Square you built a storage tank and filled it up to Nelson's chin, in three days it would be dry. Seventy-five percent of Britain's oil comes from the Middle East in a steady stream of floating tanks. Half the total merchandise at sea every day is oil. Once upon a time, it was distilled as it came out of the ground. Now it's carried in its crude state and distilled on the consumer's doorstep. Britain's front doorstep is Milford Haven. Inside these placid looking pipes and buildings, oil which has traveled two miles up through the ground and 6,000 across the sea, now ends its long journey in violent turmoil breaking up and reforming into petrol, paraffin, and fuel and lubricating oils. Most of those refined products are redistributed into our everyday lives. Some return to the sea in specially fitted naval tankers to supply warships. So much for the oil. What are the ocean tankers which carry it? Tanker building is competitive. At Barrow, work begins on a 100,000 tonner, Britain's largest. But the biggest afloat is still Japan's 132,000 ton Nisho Maru. Although economics favor the tanker that carries the mostest, the size is limited by seaworthiness and dock facilities. Over half the ocean tankers belong to the big oil companies. The remainder, privately owned, are usually registered in countries chosen exclusively for their low taxation. Liberia, for example, a small West African state, flies her flag over the world's second largest tanker fleet. For the record, this flag flies over the largest. The day is long past when oil traveled dangerously in wooden barrels in wooden ships. Here at Forley on Southampton Water, as at all terminal distilleries, it arrives day and night in tankers, which form an endless succession of floating, sawn-off pipelines. They've sucked the oil into their honeycomb tanks and now prepare to spew it out at 7,000 tons an hour. Loitering with oil aboard is too costly to contemplate. An ocean tanker's turnaround seldom takes longer than 24 hours. How about life on board for these crews, which may number up to 70? In the words of the song, what do they see? They see the sea. The Kuwait run, for example, averages 18 days non-stop. But there's plenty of work on board, especially on the outward run. There's dangerous gas to be cleared from the oil tanks. Each tank has to be inspected and examined for pitting and corrosion. Also, crude oil invariably leaves sludge, which has to be cleaned out with steam. As a fellow passenger, oil is obnoxious, destructive, and to say the least of it, untidy. Apart from the oil, there's always something in a ship that wants fixing. 
ships have a way of keeping men busy. It all started with messing about in boats. Then, of course, there is the unrelenting task of navigating in all sorts of weather. No loitering, remember, even in fog. Between watches, the crew can relax. Later, when table tennis is too hot, there's the swimming pool. Where there's oil aboard, it's just as well to have a laundry aboard too. Appetites created by the mixture of hard work and sea air are prodigious. But man can't live by bread alone. That's taken care of too. To compensate for the time at sea, tankers are noted for good food, served in communal surroundings where during meals at any rate, all men are equal. And still there's spare time in a comfortable cabin to work on that model which must be finished by Timothy's birthday. The skipper and his chief engineer plan another day. On such trips, there are no shore visits in gay foreign ports, but at sea, no two days are alike, and besides, the pay is good. Where do tanker deck officers come from? Basically, they are merchant navy trained and governed, but oil companies are naturally keen to catch them young and bring them up in their company's image. One company, cooperating with the Plymouth School of Navigation, has introduced phases of training whereby young apprentices alternate between school and practical training at sea in their own tankers. A busy ship is no more suitable for learning the basic theories of navigation and seamanship than a classroom is suitable for applying these theories to practice. But taken alternately, theory and practice grow up together. What's more, they keep in touch with the ever-growing complexity of navigational equipment, which, electronically, is getting beyond the resources of any classroom. These lads have a reasonable chance of becoming tanker skippers at 35, with a salary of 1,500 a year, and from there, stepping up steadily in ships and salaries until pension time. Upon all this energy and skill depends what is in effect a long punctuated pipeline with the punctuations gradually closing up as the demand for oil increases. Why not replace tankers with an underwater pipeline? That's a question for tomorrow. Meanwhile, the tankers must be kept moving. The oil must be kept flowing. For Britain has used a quarter of a million gallons of the stuff since this film started.